Hello and welcome to Coursera Lesson 5. Today we'll be studying some properties of chemical reaction kinetics and we'll be focusing on mass action kinetics which describe the behavior of elementary reactions. Let's get started. Reaction kinetics help us describe the speed at which a biochemical reaction takes place. To do so they teach us something about factors that will influence the rate. Some of those factors could include fixed rate constants as well as variable species concentrations depending on the way the rate law is written. Additionally it tells us something about the mechanisms that are involved. Um, so for example if you have an enzymatic reaction part of the mechanism and part of describing that rate law mathematically will depend on the presence of an enzyme which could speed up the rate at which a reaction occurs. The first term I want to go over is stoichiometric amount. Now this is the number of molecules of a given reactant or product species that participates in a biochemical reaction. So in this case, the stoichiometric amount for reactant A would be 2, for reactant B would be 1, and then also for products A and C would both be 1. This can be represented in a general way as depicted here, where the stoichiometric amount is just a coefficient on the species name for the reactant and product species. The stoichiometric coefficient is the difference between the molar amount of species on the product side, or the stoichiometric amount of species on the product side, and the molar amount of species on the reactant side. So let's compute the stoichiometric coefficients for this quick example. So let's start with species A. Uh, we see that for species A, on the product side, we have a molar amount of 1, and on the reactant side, we have a molar amount of 2. Therefore, the stoichiometric coefficient is 1 minus 2, which is negative 1. For species B, on the product side, the stoichiometric amount is 0, and on the reactant side, the stoichiometric amount is 1. So again, we have a stoichiometric coefficient of negative 1. For species C, on the product side, we have a stoichiometric amount of 1. On the reactant side, we have a stoichiometric amount of 0. And this, once again, yields a stoichiometric coefficient of, well, in this case, 1. So, as a result, you can see that the stoichiometric coefficient for reactants tends to be negative, and the stoichiometric coefficient for product species tends to be positive. Just a quick note on rates of change. Um, we'll be describing reaction rates in the next couple of slides, but here I just want to define the rate of change of a given species and show the notation for that. So the rate of change would be the rate at which a chemical reaction species changes in concentration uh, in most of our examples over time. So this can be depicted going uh, dA, dt, so where this represents the change in A over the change in time. The reaction rate can be defined with respect to a molecular species within the reaction after normalizing it with the stoichiometric coefficient. As a result of this normalization, regardless of which molecular species you choose to measure, it's possible to define a unique reaction rate. Here you can see a generalized reaction rate for this general reaction we have, and if we look just at the example where we've represented the reaction rate in terms of species A, uh, we have the rate of change dA dt, and we have it normalized by the stoichiometric coefficient C sub A. Now let's look at an example of defining the reaction rates with respect to each of the molecular species here. So for species A, we have um, nu, or the reaction rate, is equal to 1 over the stoichiometric coefficient of A, which is the amount on the product side minus the amount on the reactant side, so negative 1, times dA dt, the rate of change of A. Uh, for If we define it in terms of species B, we have the reaction rate is equal to 1 over the stoichiometric coefficient of species B, which is 0 minus 1, so again negative 1, dB dt. And if we define it in terms of species C, we have the reaction rate is equal to 1 over the stoichiometric coefficient of species C, which is 1 minus 0, 1, dC dt. Alright, now in order to describe mass action kinetics, we need to know what 
types of reactions are typically modeled using mass action. Uh, and these are elementary reactions, which are reactions that cannot be further simplified. They represent the simplest form of the biochemical reaction taking place. So a complex process like translation, for example, uh, while we may think of it as a single process, the reality is that many uh, simple elementary reactions actually are necessary to make up that complex process. Elementary mass action kinetics then take on a very simple form where the rate law is always directly proportional to the concentrations of a reactant species. Uh, so in this case, A and B in the rate law are the concentrations of reactant species A and B, and K is a rate constant which will differ depending on the reaction. All right, now this is a generalized form of the elementary mass action kinetic rate law for this generalized reaction you see here. And there are a few things to point out about this format. The first is that in the previous example, um, all of the stoichiometric amounts were one. But in the case where the stoichiometric amount, like this lowercase a here, is not one, uh, the concentration in the rate law will be raised to the power of that stoichiometric amount. So this is a generalized form for, for all reactions. So if this uh, lowercase a was a 2, we would have um, the rate law equal to k1a squared b to the whatever the stoichiometric amount for b is. Um, so that's the first main point. The second is that in the case of a reversible reaction, which we see here, we'll have the forward um, reaction rate law and the reverse reaction rate law. Um, these are rate constants for the forward and reverse reactions. Um, and when we do have a reversible reaction, then we can summarize the entire rate law um, as the difference between the forward reaction rate and the reverse reaction rate. So let's define a mass action rate law for this reversible reaction you see here. So the rate law would be equal to the forward reaction uh, rate, which is K defined by K1, or the rate constant for the forward reaction, times the concentration of A squared, because the stoichiometric amount on A is 2, um, times the concentration of species B minus the reverse reaction rate, which is K defined by K2, um, which is the reverse reaction rate constant, times the concentration of species A um, times the concentration of species C. And that is our rate law for this reversible um, reaction. All right, now for the remainder of the video, I want to talk to you a bit about chemical equilibrium. So in principle, all biochemical reactions are reversible reactions, though um, in reality, we may see a unidirectional biochemical reaction. Um, now, when you have a reversible reaction, it is possible to reach chemical equilibrium, which occurs when the forward and reverse reaction rates are equal. As a result, we can obtain this parameter called the equilibrium constant, Keq, uh, which you can arrive at by taking the forward uh, reaction rate, setting the equal to the reverse reaction rate. This is from the previous slide. And by rearranging these terms, you can get a ratio of the forward rate constant to the reverse rate constant. And this is the equilibrium uh, constant. And here's a generalized form of the uh, equilibrium constant for a general equation here, uh, where the only thing that's changed from the previous example is that we now see in the product and reactant species we have represented multiple um, multiple species and they are raised to the power of the stoichiometric amount. All right, then just to show you visually what a system in chemical equilibrium might look like, we've taken this um, this reversible reaction between species A and B and created a model using software called Tellurium. And this allows us to simulate the model. And once we simulate that model, um, we can generate a time course output, which is describing how the species A and B, the floating species, are changing in time. 
Alright, so once we have that time course, we can take a look and we see that this, under this parameter regime, here we have all the parameters that we've used in the model, model um, defined, and under this parameter regime we do get a chemical equilibrium that occurs between species A and B, which you can see is sort of at the end of this time course where the species concentrations are no longer changing in time. So in this case our model has equilibrated and um, therefore the system is at chemical equilibrium. You may see that some distinguish the equilibrium constant um, into two main groups, which are the dissociation constant and the association constant. And in the case of the dissociation constant, it's essentially describing the rate at which a complex molecule is being broken down or dissociating its t into its component parts. Um, and so in this case, the dissociation constant is equal to the product of the component parts or the product species over the um, complex itself. Now you may see that some distinguish between the dissociation constant and the association constant which are essentially two different ways of representing the equili equilibrium constant. And in, case, in the case of the dissociation constant it essentially describes the degree to which the complex, which in this case is represented as HA, is broken down into its component parts, H and A. And the dissociation constant then is defined as the ratio of the product of the um, component parts or the product species over the reactant species which is in this case the complex of these components. When the reverse reaction is represented and component parts H and A are associating into a complex HA, you can then represent the association constant. So the association constant is equal to the ratio of the complex over the product of the component parts, which are the reactant species. And just as a final note, there is of course a relationship between the dissociation constant and the association constant, and that is that the dissociation constant is equal to 1 over um, the association constant, or the reverse is also true. And that concludes Lesson 5 on Mass Action Kinetics. We've discussed how to construct a rate law using mass action, typically used for elementary reactions and we've also gone over some aspects of chemical equilibrium and the equilibrium constant. So hopefully you have a better idea of how to represent reaction rates.